partner on our information systems auditing for today. Today, we are going to be uh, considering information systems audit requirements. And uh, this is our, the fourth topic in the, in the lecture. The first lecture provided an introduction of what an information system auditing is, uh, the legal requirements in the Ghanaian context, and how we want to possibly be uh, an information system auditor. And then we also consider the scope of information systems uh, auditing. The second and third lectures were on uh, hardware and software requirements for the purposes of information systems auditing. Today, we are going to be looking at information systems auditing requirements. And to do that, we'll be very much interested in trying to discuss the critical requirements of an information systems audit in terms of both uh, input and uh, delivery. And then we'll also try to have an extensive understanding of the scope of an information systems audit the types of evidence that one an information system auditor may consider and the areas that an information system auditor should uh, uh, likely focus on. So to do that, we'll try to understand what we mean by risk analysis, and then we'll look at also issues about audit evidence and the audit trail. Now to start off, I would want us to try, first of all, to understand what we mean by risk analysis in the context of uh, information systems audit uh, requirements. A risk analysis basically involves the likelihood or a risk basically involves the likelihood that an entity would uh, face a vulnerability and how this vulnerability could be exploited uh, for harmful purposes for the, in terms of the, organi the organization's information systems uh, uh, operations. Then if we are talking about how vulnerable a system may be in the context of risk, we also need to understand what we mean by vulnerability. A vulnerability basically would be the inherent weakness that uh, exists uh, within an information system operation. And this inherent weakness can be exploited by people for their personal, personal gains. In that case, then the vulnerability become uh, some kind of a threat. We also need to understand what we mean by threats. And threats stand for things or events that are uncertain and can cause a loss to an organization's information system operations or resources. So basically threats are uncertain events. And they are threats because these uncertain events could likely give a cause a problem in the information systems audit or information systems operations or information system access and then the likelihood of a control failing and even the likelihood of a control if the control is going to fail the likelihood of it being uh, activated is also uncertain and all of this calls for what we refer to as uh, risk analysis so in terms of risk analysis we basically need to understand what we mean by risk which is a likelihood that an entity would face a vulnerability. And what we mean by a vulnerability? The vulnerability is the inherent weakness of the system, a process that can be exploited by somebody, either within or outside the organization, for their personal gains, okay? Then when we want to conduct risk analysis, uh, we have to note that risk may not Risk may materialize for various reasons. Risk may happen for, a period for various reasons. From the perspective of information system audit, risk materializes because of failure of a control in an information system. So we want to use uh, our understanding of what, uh, why risk may materialize to try and understand the risk factors that may be inherent in a business operation or an information system operation. Now, there are several risk factors that are inherent in business operations, and we will look at some nine examples. And the first one to consider is the access uh, risk. And access risk basically refers to the risk of an unauthorized person 
having access to information assets. And an authorized person having access to organizations, either having access to information resources through access of the password or having physical access to organizations information assets or information resources. The second one is what we refer to as a business disruption risk. And the business disruption risk basically refers to the risk of non-availability of services from the organization as a result of failure in the information system resources of that organization. The third one is the credit risk. And credit risk basically refers to failure of a counterparty or an external party or a third party honoring a payment uh, obligation. So if our, our uh, suppliers, we owe our suppliers or our debtors owe us, and they are supposed to pay within a particular time frame, time frame, and they fail, the susceptibility of their failure to pay will be referred to as a credit risk. Then the fourth one is the customer service risk. And this risk basically refers to the risk of a customer being deprived of services the customer may, may want. Then we also have uh, the data integrity risk. And data integrity risk refers to the risk of a possible compromise of the data which is captured by the information resources. And it may arise for various reasons. And some of these various reasons is that and there was an access risk. And access risk is one of the initial risks we looked at. So if there is an access risk and a control is compromised and somebody is able to have access to the organization's information resources, then there will be data integrity risk because the person may be able to edit the data that is captured in the information uh, resources. Then we also have financial or external report misstatement risk. So misstatement risk basically arise when there are material or immaterial misstatements that are contained in the financial reports or reports of the entity. Now for auditors, the reports may be material. Anyway, the, the error or misstatement may be material. And if it's material, then it, it will inform the auditor's uh, opinion. But a risk may not also be material. It may be immaterial, but in individual, it may be immaterial, but in aggregate, if we bring all the immaterial risks together, the risk may be material. In that case, it can also have a significant effect in the information system operations of the entity. Then we also have a fraud risk, and fraud risk basically refers to the risk of losses arising out of people's fraudulent activities in their use of the information resources. There's also the possibility that there are usually legal frameworks that guide operations of almost every entity. So if an organization is guided, maybe if it's a company, the company's code or the company law will guide it. If it's a partnership, there's a partnership law and SMEs, they, all these entities are governed by some form of a legal framework. But there's a risk of non-compliance in terms of the legal framework that guides these entities. And if, and we refer to that risk as a legal and regulatory risk, the risk to, and it refers to the risk of non-compliance to legal and regulatory requirements and the consequences that may arise as a result of the non-compliance. The last one is the fiscal harm risk. And this is the most common risk to all of us. And it refers to the risk of suffering from a boldly, boldly harm. Okay. So nine risks are critical in our understanding of our risk analysis and risk assessment in terms of the information system resources. Then what I now want us to look at will be to look at the, uh, the forms, what forms the basis of an information systems audit requirements. And initially I started by trying to explain what we mean by threat and vulnerability. Threats, vulnerability, risk, all of this as well as exposure and its likelihood of occurrence, all of this forms the basis of an information system or digital requirements. So I want us to look at the, the, the meanings in detail. And the first one I want us to look at is the, uh, the threat. When we say threat, we basically we are referring to the fact that a potential event could exploit a vulnerability in an information system. And this could lead to the entity being exposed to chances of suffering a loss. And the chances of suffering a loss could be as a result of fraudulent activities that may be carried by people 
within the organization. Now, the harm to an information system may be in the form of a compromise in the confidentiality, the integrity, or the availability of information resources. If an, an insider or an employee leaks some data to uh, trade, trade secret to outside, then there will, be a, there will be a data integrity issue. If this insider or employee is also able to have, uh, to, is able to override and access control and uh, change some data within the information system resources, then it will also lead to data integrity issues. That is, this is what we mean by threat. Now, the next thing I want us to look at is vulnerability. And we have explained this uh, already. Vulnerability basically is a weakness in the system that can potentially be exploited by, by others because of the threat it, it presents. And the weakness in the system may be in terms of the design, the, the design of the technology in terms of the implementation or any other aspect of the information access. For example, a poor access control method is a vulnerability. A poor access control method is a vulnerability. And this may allow a hacker, and the fact that it may allow a hacker to do something, this allowance that may be given to the hacker or presented to the hacker as a result of the poor access is what we refer to as a threat. And if the hacker is able to, uh, if, if the poor access control is able to allow the hacker to have access, the hacker will be able to have illegitimate access to the system. And the illegitimate access to the system will be what? The risk. And so the extent of safeguards implemented often undermines the level of vulnerability. If the safeguards are very high, the level of vulnerability will reduce. If the, the safeguards are very low, then the level of vulnerability will also be very, very high. Then there's also another key thing we need to understand. What we mean by exposure? And exposure is the extent of loss an entity is likely to suffer when a particular risk materializes. Example of a loss of an exposure may include something like maybe loss of business, loss of reputation, compromise of privacy, and even injury or loss of uh, human lives. All of this may be examples of uh, exposure. Then there's also the term likelihood. When we say likelihood, what do we mean? Likelihood is an estimation of the probability that the thread will attempt to exploit the vulnerability. And upon being able to successfully exploit it, it will lead to or it will cause a loss to an entity. And then finally, we need to also understand what we mean by attack. Attack is the act of threat seeking to exploit the vulnerability through a set of actions. And this set of actions are geared towards compromising confidentiality, data integrity, and the availability of information system assets for uh, prompt use within the organization. Now, what could an organization do in terms of information system control? What can they do? Information system security has three characteristics which we also need to examine. Information security has the following three characteristics. The first one is confidentiality. An organization should always ensure that accessibility is only to accessibility to data or key information resources is only allowable to authorized persons, authorized individuals. And these authorized individuals are the only people who must have access to the information, those information resources, confidentiality. Then there's also the issue of integrity. And integrity involves ensuring that the information that is contained in the information resources are complete throughout the cycle of inputting, through, throughout the cycle of inputting, processing, and even the output of the data. We have to ensure that everything is accurate, is confidential, in order to maintain information system or data integrity. Then the, the last one is availability, where we need to ensure that uh, there's only really need-based access to information for all authorized users. Anytime a particular kind of information is needed, it should be readily available. Okay. Now I want us to look at the objectives specifically information systems audit objectives. The goal of an information system audit is to achieve some critical objectives. And we'll look at the objectives which are classified or categorized into nine objectives. The first one, the first objective or 
an information system audit is to ensure the adequacy and effectiveness of internal control. And we have looked at the categories of controls. We have access controls typically. So to ensure, when we ensure that there's adequacy and effectiveness of all the controls that are instituted within the organization to safeguard information system resources, that's one key objective of information system audit objective to ensure that there's adequacy and there's effectiveness of internal controls. The second one is to ensure that the information resources are allocated to constituents of information system in efficient and effective manner. There should not be an overload of allocation of resources to one department or one unit or one person to the detriment of the other. So efficient allocation of resources to the various constituents within the organization. The third one is that an information system audit should be able to provide assurance that the systems related assets are safeguarded, they are properly protected, safeguarding the information uh, system resources. And then the fourth one to ensure that the information is information, whatever information that is captured by the information resources is accurate and available on time. And also the information should be what should be reliable to ensure accuracy of the information, ensure availability of the information, as well as the reliability of the information. Now the fifth one is to ensure that we provide reasonable assurance that all errors, omissions, and irregularities are prevented, detected, corrected, and above all, all of this must be what reported. So a particular audit of information systems within an organization should try to ensure that the controls that are instituted by either the internal audit department, if there's none, by the organization, the internal controls that are instituted are able to prevent some irregularities from happening. They are able to ensure that some errors or omissions are avoided. Are avoided. But if a particular error, omission, or irregularity is, is, not be, is not able to be prevented by the internal controls instituted within the organization, then we should have controls which would likely detect them and then the organization should be able to correct them if those controls are able to detect them. If the audit is able to detect that all these things are not happening, then the audit will have to report whatever uh, controls that have been overridden within the organization. Then the C one is the reviewing the system to ensure that there's compliance to organizational policies, procedures, standards, and even the legal regime which governs the existence of the organization and other operations of the, of the organization. The seventh one is to review the application, review application and opera, operation systems to ensure that needs of the users are met in a timely manner so that there is necessary compliance, so that necessary compliance are achieved, as well as audit trace being incorporated, documentation is completed, and system data integrity and security are all maintained. The last but not the least is the, is the fact that uh, information system audit should be able to identify and recognize the potential threats that can compromise confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information assets. Then the last one is to ensure that the management takes appropriate action or appropriate detective, corrective, and preventive Action. The actions that an organization would take would be in different categories. We're saying that these categories would be, they, they can take a detective action, corrective action, and a preventive action. And we looked at some of these things in the first part of our lecture, the lecture one. Now, how, considering the objectives of an information system uh, audit, objective of an information system audit, we now want to look at information system effectiveness and efficiency. And all information, all information system edit, auditors are required to know the difference between these two terms, system effectiveness and system work efficiency. It is important that an, an information system, systems auditor understand the difference between these two because during the course of information systems audit, the auditor is often required to comment on the effectiveness and efficiency of a of system. So when we say effectiveness, what, what do we mean? Effectiveness basically involves effectiveness evaluation determines whether the system is achieving its objectives and whether 
the system should be continued, it should be modified, should be upgraded, or it should, or it should completely be what discontinued. Then there's also the, the issue of efficiency and how different is effectiveness from efficiency. Efficiency of a system is reflected by usage of the minimum amount of resources, the use of minimal resources to achieve the organization's objectives. So the resources may be of different kinds, including machine time, peripherals, system software, application software, and human resources. But how do we combine all of this in a way that we can have minimal combination to achieve the organizational objective? That does the difference between these two terms. Now, despite an organization's working to prevent, detect, or even correct any uh, overriding of controls or overriding of controls. There are still different ways that people or employees within the organization can abuse an information system. We want to look at how it can happen. An information system abuse may manifest itself in different ways, in different ways. And the abuse may come as a result of a destruction of the organization's assets by individuals, either theft of the assets modification of the assets so that the person who is modifying it can happen will be able to override the controls therein then we also have privacy violation yeah people trying to have access to data that they are not authorized to to have that way the data integrity within the organization will be compromised then there's also the disruption of operations then an authorized use of asset assets if an access control is provided, then people can have an authorized use of the information access within the organization. So these six are the different ways through which people within the organization or even outsiders may be able to abuse the information systems within the organization. Now, how do we ensure that the information access are safeguarded? We want us to look at the asset safeguarding objective and process. The task of having an information system assets safeguarding mechanism in place involves a number of a number of procedures, a number of procedures. And we'll look, we'll, I would like us to look at four areas. Four areas. The first thing that one can do to safeguard assets, information assets, would be to go through a process of compiling a functional information technology asset list. Asset list we should be able to compile a list of IT asset functional list. All the information resources that are working within the organization, we have to have an asset. The accountant will call it an asset register. We must have something like that. Secondly, we should also have information technology system detailing, indicating the functionality, indicating in detail what each particular information asset is uh, uh, what activity it is engaging, what software is, 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 is on it, and the purpose for which the software is installed. Then overall asset safeguarding, and then uh, assigning probabilities. And assigning probabilities basically involves the entity, the entity going through a process to assign uh, some numbers to different losses that could arise out of failure or compromise of the safeguarding mechanism of the information assets. An assignment of probabilities may be based on past experience. Okay, so four critical things when it comes to asset safeguarding, the process of asset safeguarding within the organization. Now, the, 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 the important thing I want us to look at is to try to understand how the information systems auditor can collect audit evidence, considering the information system assets that are safeguarded or in operation within the organization. How would the information system auditor collect audit evidence? Now, there are different techniques of audit evidence collection. And the various techniques may be, various techniques may be used by information system auditors to gather audit evidence. And we'll look at some five different ways that are most commonly used. And one of it is the review of organizational structure, organizational documentation, and the standards and practices that are in operation within the organization. The second one is interviewing appropriate personnel and observing processes and what? And operations. 
So when the information system auditors get into the organization, one way they can collect their evidence, apart from reviewing the organizational structure, other documents, policy documents, and whatnot, they also need to interview appropriate or unit heads, system administrators, and those who have particular or reserve access rights. And then whilst people are working, they can also stand by as independent observers of how operations are being conducted using the information system resources. So the second one is interview, interviewing appropriate personnel. The third one is using audit documentation techniques, such as flow charts. And this flow chart will be able to help the auditor identify how the, the, the flow of data within the organization, the flow of data within the organization by use of the information system uh, resources. The auditor may also use some kind of a narrative or decision trees or tables to be able to uh, document certain things. The fourth one is applying analytical reviews. This would involve the use of some kind of mathematical techniques. We have to remember that considering how vast the nature of an organization may be and its information resources, the auditor will not be able to individually examine all the information system resources. So the auditor may apply some mathematical techniques to be able to what, sample and then look at based on the sample uh, that is uh, generated, based on the sample, the organized the information system auditor upon examining the sample will then generalize his findings to the entire information access or information resources within the organization. The last one is using software tools to analyze different kinds of logs that are captured by the information system resources, and as, as well as using software to examine the audit trails built into the system. Okay, so five ways the auditor can collect evidence is through reviewing organizational structure and documents, interviewing, using audit documentation techniques such as flow charts and questionnaires, and then using analytical procedures, which will involve some level of uh, sampling. Now, whilst this may be the techniques of audit evidence collection, we also need to understand the categories of audit evidence. So in this next slide, I want us to look at the information systems auditor may select appropriate methodologies to help him collect the audit evidence. Appropriate techniques or the methodology to, to be able to collect the audit evidence. And we'll look at about 10 categories listed below. One would be the most common one is that fiscal examination. The auditor may physically inspect in the presence of other uh, officers the tangible information system assets. The information system auditor may physically count and inspect for the presence or for the pre to, to be able to confirm the presence of different kinds of computer equipment, printers, and so forth within the organization. So fiscal examination is one. The second one is confirmation, where a response is needed from an independent third party. Mostly the auditor may write to somebody to confirm the existence of some either they supply some information resource to the organization at a particular time. Or, or not. So fiscal examination, confirmation. The third one is documentation. And this involves the examination of documents within documents and record within the organization to substantiate information, especially those information that will involve the designing and function of a particular software or a network. For example, a review of service agreements will substanti substantiate the, the service entitlement claims made by uh, the ODT. Or the organization. So we have fiscal examination, confirmation, and then documentation. Then we also have observation. And this involves observing the conduct of specific activities as they are being carried out within the organization. For example, the auditor may verify whether the particular operation is performed under dual control. Two people are performing it. First one is doing this, the other is doing this. Sometimes observation may usually be done and may require corroborative evidence. So we've seen something going on here. And then maybe the auditor can ask follow up questions to be able to co corroborate whatever you would have uh, observed. Then we also have what we refer to as inquiry. An inquiry here involves uh, evidences that are created through obtaining written and oral information from the company against specific queries. So the auditor may identify specific queries, and then the auditor will use the process of inquiry to, to be able to solicit or obtain written 
and oral responses to, to this. Then we also have processing accuracy. And processing accuracy involves rechecking a sample of activities performed by the auditee, that is performed by the company for confirming process accuracy. So a typical example of a, a processing accuracy may be an information system auditor can test the processing accuracy of computations with the use of an appropriate software. The auditor can also do this by observing logs or by reviewing data in certain fields in the object uh, data file. The seventh one is screenshots. The auditor may take screenshots of errors that are observed during the audit. Various operating systems provide different methodologies to obtain the screenshots. And we all know what, the, what, what screenshots are. So the eighth one involves the log files, involves the log files. Then there are log files involved the access logs, transaction logs, fault logs, error logs, and other audit trails provided by corroborative evidence to the, to the errors. Then the last but not the least is testing software results, where software has been used for testing. For example, network security testing, output reports generated by such software provided provide evidence of errors in the system. And the last one may involve what we refer to as analytical procedures. And this will involve the use of comparisons, mathematical approaches to compare by using ratios in order to determine the relationship between uh, different tasks to determine the reasonableness of the process and activities that are being, uh, that are being audited. Okay, so 10, and the 10 are, I'm going to go back again. The 10 are fiscal examination, confirmation, categories of audit evidence, fiscal examination, confirmation, documentation, observation, inquiry, uh, processing accuracy, screenshots, log files, then testing software results. And the last one is uh, analytical, analytical procedures. Now, the next thing I want us to look at is what is referred to as the audit trail. We may have heard this term in the past, audit trail. When we say audit trail, what do we mean? Audit trails are basically records of an activity that can be used to reconstruct the performance of the activity. So we say that every activity follows a particular procedure and this procedure should be recorded. When this procedure is recorded, it means that anybody at all who takes the procedure, the procedure recorded will be able to reconstruct the process by following the steps included in the, the procedure. And we refer to that in the auditing panels as the audit trail. An audit trail is very essential because it is very critical as a detective control. We can use the audit trail to be able to detect what may have happened in the system and what anomaly, anomaly exists within the system. But it can also be designed to act as a preventive one as a preventive control, because people know that everything they are doing is being tracked or logged. They will be careful in terms of what they do. Then we also have what is called the system logs. The system, four system logs that are used to the information system auditor are listed below. That's used by the information system auditor uh, indicated below. Total uh, control, total verification. And control, total verification basically refers to the controls in accounting, they refer to this particular uh, approach as the control use of control accounts. And the control total verification exists in terms of control total, such as record counts, line item counts, financial totals, quantity totals, and hash totals. For example, an example of this could be account numbers can be used to verify the accuracy of input processing and then, and then what? Output. Then we also have transaction locks. Transaction logs acts as a processing control and provide an audit trail. They are useful for file reconstruction and error tracing when an error occurs in updating uh, online files. It is also very useful in recovering from a disaster because we know the computer keeps a record of all transactions. If there's a disaster and we have a transaction log, we'll be able to reconstruct and determine what transaction happened before the, the loss. A typical example of a system log, either a transaction log or a control total verification is seen below. This is an example of a system log indicating the timelines on which a particular activity happened and the ID of the event and who did what at any particular
particular point in time. Yes. We also have what we refer to as uh, operator logs. And, opera and operator logs involve operational staff. And operational staff should independently be able to maintain a log of their activities unless it is automatically maintained by the, by the system. So sometimes manually, the operator, operational level staff may be required to keep this log themselves. And the log should include whatever, whatever is appropriate. At least the following should be included. System log in and log out time. When you log in, when you log out, the system errors you observe as the you, you operate or work with the system and the correct the corrective actions that were were taken. Then C, we also have what is referred to as system-based confirmation of correct handling of data files and computer output. Then the name of person making the log the log entry, results of the comparison of the operator's log against operating procedures to see whether something out of place has been logged by the operational level staff. Then the last but not the least is the fault logs. Fault logs. All faults encountered by users should be reported. And we have to keep a log of all the faults. The log should be kept of all the faults. Okay. Now part of the critical things in terms of log uh, fault logs are the review of fault logs to verify fault resolution. We always have to come back to the fault log to find out this fault that was logged has it now been uh, resolved. Then B will be to review the corrective measures to verify I, whether the controls have been compromised. So we may have a fault log because somebody tried to do what to compromise the system. So we have to constantly review them to be sure that the 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 the, the fault was not what was not as a result of the compromise that was engineered by somebody within the organization and whether a corrective action was taken and whether this corrective action that was taken is authorized or not. Okay, the last one is an analysis of all fault logs to decide whether the faults should be included in the risk register, even when they were successfully resolved. Sometimes when a risk is not resolved, we may include it in the, in the risk register because this particular fault, if it keeps recurring, may lead to the compromise of particular controls. And this the, the compromise of these controls may lead to the, the, the loss of information um, assets, or maybe the loss of the data. Loss of data or creation of data lead to data issues. Okay. So basically this brings us to the end of uh, this short lecture on risk analysis, objectives of information system audit as part of uh, yeah, as part of the information system audit uh,